um, type in the chat and hopefully we'll notice, but uh, try is the uh, raise hand button. Uh, this is really an honor for me. I basically came into my current politics today watching uh, videos of the Communist University on YouTube. And so it's really a, a pretty crazy thing to actually be speaking at the Communist University. So uh, it's really just an honor to be here. So in a way, like the events on Wednesday were like a gift from God for me for this presentation, because I think that it really helped show that there actually is a crisis in the US. And, it, and it's quite obvious that we are in the midst of a crisis, a political crisis, a health crisis, and an economic crisis. You know, massive unemployment, massive uh, lack of job opportunities, and just complete economic decay with government that is just completely irresponsive to the needs of, of the people. And we're seeing political violence become more and more of a regular occurrence in the US. We're not approaching, you know, huge death tolls and Weimar scale, you know, polarization with communists and fascist street gangs duking it out, you know, with guns. But we are seeing political violence and polarization that as at a level that is beyond anything that has happened while I've been alive, I think the next probable, probable next real comparison will probably be the, the 1960s to what's going on today, but definitely an interesting time to be alive. And so my aim in this presentation is to give an accurate vision of the state of US politics, what are the political forces at play and what are the potentials that have opened up for the left and how do we propagate Marxist politics in the US given these potentials that have opened up? So I think, you know, for this discussion, we could go all the way back to the beginning of US history and look at, you know, the long term economic trends. But I think just for the sake of simplicity, I think we should look at the 2016 election, which kind of began this, uh, this period of polarization. So we had eight years of liberal centrism under Obama and Obama was essentially able to create a popular front of the centrist liberals in the left and under this idea of this idealistic post-racial democracy. But instead we, you know, we had massive economic crisis. We had um, massive protests against police brutality, which were often forgotten about in light of the recent ones. And for much of America, economic conditions worsened. You have the massive uh, deindustrialization of um, middle America, which has helped kind of create a, a base for Trump. And you have a, uh, a situation where young people do not have the same economic opportunities as you know, the boomer generation, which is essentially a generation that has accumulated more wealth than any other generation in history. And the economic opportunity there is no longer there. So you have a lot of economic dissatisfaction. And so this has essentially created a situation where centrist liberalism just doesn't appeal anymore as a political option. And so what you have is the rise of figures like Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. And I'm not trying to equivocate the two because obviously they're not correct. That's not correct. They're completely different people. You know, they're completely different politics, but nonetheless, you know, they were trying to speak to a base and they were trying to mobilize people for some kind of alternative to the current liberal order that Obama represented. So, you know, Bernie Sanders, you know, he was able to speak to, you know, an audience of enthusiastic youth, many of them college educated and looking for, you know, jobs in the professional managerial class that were just not available to them. You also had um, a lot of the working class was behind Bernie as well, even though, you know, the unions often did not back him and back to the, the centrist Democrats. And on the other hand, you have a uh, Donald Trump who essentially speaks to the boomers. And, you know, there is a reason I'm not talking about this in class terms because essentially both these parties are made of cross-class coalitions. And so the party politics in the US is not it doesn't happen, it's not expressed as a class conflict. It's expressed as essentially a, a battle between these two cross-class coalitions 
that are often marked by cultural markers. And essentially, you know, this two party system, it, it locks a political system in this country to where class antagonisms really can't express themselves except in the most mystified possible way. And the issue is, you know, we have this crisis of liberal centrism, but it does not lead to an alternative pull of working class power in any way, because the unions are gutted, labor has no political expression. There was an attempt to create a labor party in the early 90s that went absolutely nowhere. It was an absolute embarrassment. And so what we have instead are these kind of pop-up attempts by you know, various politicians and celebrities to kind of manufacture a coalition top down to address public grievances. And what's interesting about these you know, various coalitions is that, like I just said earlier, it's, if you look at you know, how they create their voting blocks, it's really not based on class. It's about age divisions. It's Bernie, the millennials, and, and Trump, the boomers. And so basically, as I said, this two-party system where both parties are class coalitions, class-class coalitions, it basically makes class struggle incapable of expressing itself in the existing two-party system which is molded into our system by the constitution. It's not, it's by design that we have this two party system. So we have the Sanders campaign and it was essentially an attempt to revive social democratic politics from scratch. There was no attempt to build up a social democratic party based on the organized power of the labor movement that would enter government and represent the working class as a block within the capitalist state. Instead, you know, basically Sanders used the media, he used his, um, his, his spot as a senator to create a, a media sensation, to create a, a popular, you know, kind of grassroots movement out of almost nothing. And, you know, it, it really was impressive what he was able to do without actually having had an organized base of labor on his side. I don't mean to say that no union supported Bernie. You had the uh, NNU, the National Nurses Union. You had um, the United Electricians. You did have unions that backed Bernie, but you also had a lot of unions that did not back Sanders and are essentially in the pockets of, of the centrist Democrats. And so despite his lack of an organized base in labor, Sanders was still able to intervene politically as some kind of representative of, of the working class, regardless of the fact that he was not a representative of the working class. The fact that he was able to do some kind of political intervention in the sphere of politics as a, some kind of socialist. And we can argue if Bernie's a real socialist or not. I personally don't find that argument very interesting. But uh, regardless of the fact that because he was able to make this intervention in politics, he was able to do more for the US left than any leftist activist group has in recent history. And a lot of people are going to get mad at me for saying this because they don't want to acknowledge the fact that Bernie Sanders and his campaign has, has essentially done more to reignite the US left. Because you know, we have all, you know, the left is full of local activists who put tons of hard work into organizing and going to protest. And you know, they want to think that all that hard work over time is, is basically what led to this. But really, I think it was because Sanders was able to make a political intervention due to his spot as a senator, as marginal as he was, that the left, US left was able to start forming as some kind of cohesive force. And this is expressed in the rise of the Democratic Socialists of America. After the Bernie campaign in 2016, the DSA, which was essentially a pretty marginal group of people around organized around the ideas of Michael Harrington, whose ideas really have no appeal to the youth of the US today. Yet the DSA became this kind of socialist youth movement because of various connections with the Sanders campaign. And you know, the DSA has a lot of flaws. I, you know, I don't want to deny this. But the truth of the matter is is that this is the only real socialist organization in the USA, at least since the 1970s probably, that has had any kind of consist consistent membership, any kind of organized base, dues paying base, any kind of actual national presence. And the mere existence of this org has created 
lot of opportunities that has essentially weakened the sect system in the United States. Essentially before we had DSA, all we had was a movementist left, a movementist activist left of dispersed activist movements and various you know, sects, most of which are leftovers of the new communist movement. And so the DSA is basically where the movement is today. And a lot of the memberships of the sects realized this. They realized that you know their small, you know, clubs of a few people and a dog were not going to go anywhere. That this was where the place to intervene if they wanted to have their politics become relevant was. And so, the truth is that much of the left is is in the, of the far left. I would say the the radical left in the U.S. is is basically in denial about this and. There's a lot of sectarianism towards the democratic socialist America. There's a lot of critiques of Bernie Sanders. A lot of these critiques are legitimate. Sanders is an imperialist. Sanders was running on a corporatist platform. He was essentially a New Deal liberal. But regardless, these leftists who completely dismissed the Sanders phenomena were unable to actually, they were unable to actually interact with this phenomena in a, in a productive way. And I think actually I'm going to kind of outline what the left responses to Sanders was. And I've kind of, I'm kind of talking more about 2020 now to make that clear. So we have Jacobin who are uh, probably the biggest leftist uh, media outlet that's vaguely Marxist today. And um, they were fully supportive of Sanders. And in my opinion, they essentially were tailless of Sanders. They basically, you know, they basically were unwilling to be critical of him. They basically portrayed his kind of New Deal socialism as the real thing. And they wanted to ride the Bernie wave all the way. I imagine some of these Jacobin people probably thought that, you know, they might get jobs in the Sanders administration. And this kind of led a lot of leftists to overreact by completely dismissing the Sanders phenomenon. And so on the other hand, we have, um, another leftist group, a Marxist center, it's a newer group. And their position on the, uh, the Bernie election was pretty much to ignore it and to focus on local activism, change you know, ideas. Change is not going to happen through you know, mass political campaigns that are interacting with bourgeois electoralism. We need to be focusing on you know, building up our local organizations and coordinating on you know, them on a national level and doing what they call base building and you know, direct action, change happens in the street, all that stuff. DSA supported Sanders. Some people in DSA thought that they shouldn't support Sanders, that it's pointless because any positive effects of the Sanders campaign radicalizing people could be taken advantage of without having to completely hitch the wagon to Sanders. But uh, essentially DSA supported Sanders and refused to endorse any candidate other than Sanders which meant that when Sanders lost the primary and Biden was the candidate, there were some dissenting voices within DSA that said it was necessary to campaign for Biden. It was necessary to do this to stop fascism from taking over. And some of the, uh, a small group, I will say it was not a lot of people in DSA. It was a small group of some high level members who signed on to this statement. There was an outrage. People were calling them to be expelled for this, for breaking you know, party discipline. But the issue is in DSA, there is no party discipline. So technically they could do anything they wanted and, and get away with it as long as they didn't break the code of conduct. But there was an outrage, people were mad. So I think you know the idea that you know DSA are simply going to sheepdog the, the Democrats no matter what really isn't true. It's not as clear cut as that. Um, PSL, the uh, Marxist group of the United States, it is one of the larger, uh, I guess, ML aligned sects in the US. I don't, technically they're Marxist, so I don't know if they're really ML or not. You know, it's the current membership is way more Stalinist than the older leadership is, but they supported Sanders in some states, but not very seriously. Um, it was kind of just a you know, well, you know, if, he, if you're, you might as well vote for him in a state if he becomes a president, if he becomes a candidate and he's running in a state, 
where um, Lariva isn't you know, on the ballot, then vote for Sanders. So it was kind of a, a critical support. Um, the international Marxist tendency, the uh, Trotskyist group, they, uh, they took a stance um, that was critical of Sanders, but they actually did see the opportunity that his run provided and IMT has been trying to uh, do work in the DSA. Left Voice, which is a, a relatively new Trotskyist publication. Um, they essentially were consistently anti-Sanders and saw Sanders voters as capitulating to Democrats. And so the truth is, is that the left was incapable of responding to the Sanders campaign in a way that wasn't pure tailism or, or pure dismissal and rejection of the opportunities to provide. And I'm not saying I even know the correct way to have responded to this campaign because I was fairly skeptical of Sanders myself. But nonetheless, looking back, I think the left really did show its inability to interact with an actual mass political phenomena during the Sanders campaign. You know, people claimed it was a a breach of Marxist principle to vote for you know, anyone with a D by their name. Others invested all of their hope in the Sanders without any kind of serious strategic perspective. And the truth is, is that this was you know, a doomed kamikaze mission. The, you know, the, even though it contributed to the political conditions that allowed for a left movement outside of the sex, Sanders was not, it was, it was not gonna happen. He could not win the Democratic primary simply because they would not let him. You know, this was revealed in the 2016 email leaks. And if the party did not consolidate around Biden and oppose him, then, you know, I think they would have played dirty tricks either way. There's no way that the Democratic Party would have allowed Sanders to become the candidate, not even because of his economic programs, but because of what he said about the political system. And I think that was really what scared people was because he did talk about changing the political system and shaking that up. And I think that threatened the existing donor base of the Democratic Party, because that is really who controls the Democratic Party is the corporations and the finance capital and all these people. And so they were never going to let him win. And when the party coalesced around Biden, it, it was clear that Democratic primary voters were not going to make a risk on this, you know, socialist. They primarily cared about defeating Trump. Democratic primary voters are not the most working class, you know, base. And, you know, the Democratic oriented media has a strong hold on these people. They were constantly going against Sanders. And so the idea that Sanders could win a Democratic primary and then become president, it's just, it was not going to happen. And, you know, various pundits have tried to explain the decline of the Sanders campaign by saying it was because, you know, Sanders abandoned his, you know, class first, um, economic, you know, justice oriented platform in favor of embracing identity politics, which I think is very simplistic as an argument. I don't really think when I when Bernie talks, I don't think of the language of intersectionality. Maybe some of the people around him promoting him kind of spoke in that language, but I really don't think that there was this shift of Bernie towards like heavy identity politics and intersectionality. And others said that it was because, you know, Sanders played up the word socialism more this election, he was more willing to, you know, to say the S word. So that was why um, Sanders was able to, uh, but that's, that's essentially, you know, that argument is that that's why he lost. And I just don't think that's the case. The truth is that the Democratic primary voters are going to be loyal to the party machine and they care primarily about defeating Trump. Sanders was too much of a risk to take so the Democratic voters chose Biden. No stealing the election was necessary. So I think, you know, the memo here is, you know, what we've been saying all these years is that the Democratic Party is a dead end. They're not going to, it's not our machine. You know, it's not a mass membership party funded by any kind of organized working class movement. It's, it's a, basically a cartel for 
coalition of finance capitalists and whatnot to you know control these campaigns and it's it's not going to happen so why on the other then why is the left investing so much you know political energy into the squad and into changing the democrats i think that's really that's really the thing that we have to uh figure out and how it change so anyway move on sanders campaign dies down joe biden is on the ascendant covid 19 pandemic picks up and essentially we're thrown into an economic crisis and a lockdown crisis. So this creates extremely fragile social circumstances. The state is just completely dropping the ball on doing anything to solve this. I was honestly hoping that maybe, you know, our government would get its, its act together and and fix this issue and actually, uh, you know, take action to fight the pandemic, but instead they just let it spiral out of control. And today was actually the day of the largest death toll of COVID so far. I think it was over 4,000 people died today. So this is a public health disaster, probably the greatest public health disaster. And I don't know how long, just, it's, it's, it's just such a disaster. And you have mass unemployment, you know, you have this, unevenly imposed lockdown that is completely, completely just, just they completely fucked it up for the lack of a better word. It was not a cohesive lockdown. It was scattered. It was, they did not provide social support for people who needed it. So essentially it was, it was applied in the most class biased way whatsoever. Essentially, you know, the professional managerial class who were able to stay home and work on their computers were able to, you know, have, were able to stay home and have all their groceries delivered and whatnot. Whereas, you know, the working class has massively suffered, you know, and regardless of the need of a lockdown, of the need of real action be taken against the pandemic, the way it was applied and the way it happened has been a disaster. And I, I don't think that, you know, that is buying into any kind of anti-lockdown rhetoric. It's just the way it was applied and the way it happened has just caused massive unemployment massive social disturbance, massive mental health crises, and it's atomizing the public. It's a very bad situation. It was only a matter of time before massive unrest and rioting broke out. And I just wanna make it clear that the 2020s protests were worth supporting. It was a real popular movement against an oppressive state that is mismanaging a massive public health crisis while you know, murdering people in the streets in just the most blatantly disgusting way. And it would be pathetic if there was not massive protests and rioting in response to this. The problem was, is that the far left used the opportunities created by this movement to essentially, you know, as advertising opportunities for their sects or to tail the NGOs or to engage in all these ultra left, you know, insurrectionary fantasies that this was a revolution that you know, we're going to, you know, take power any minute now. We're, you know, we're going to go on the offensive and, you know, this is our moment. This is our 1905. And so in my mind, these protests basically could not have gone any other way though. You know, it, it showed the inability of the left to take political leadership of the struggling masses. And instead what you have is NGOs, which are you know basically fronts for various foundations like the Ford Foundation and Democratic Party, these people have the resources, they have presence in you know the communities, they're able to essentially organize these things and, and control the political content. And of course, there was instances where this people were not able to keep control. There were outbursts of militancy that you know went against you know these various democratic aligned NGOs, but you know that protesting harder and more militancy is not actually creating a political alternative. It's just, you know, it's all, you know, it's all bark, but no bite. If you don't have an actual political movement that can, you know, make something of all this, you know, rioting and, you know, attacks on a uh, state infrastructure. And so, you know, basically the hope of the left during these protests is that, well, we'll get our small groups of radicals and affinity groups to kind of push these in a more radical direction 
and you know maybe we'll you know create some kind of you know revolutionary situation this was you know a minority of the left i don't think that many people had these illusions but in the end this is obviously a useless strategy it's the classic uh, you know idea that the spontaneity of the masses is on its own going to create a, a revolutionary situation or some kind of rupture and we just need to kind of uh, be the spark that you know pushes it over the edge and the truth is that you know there was no way the left could have actually taken advantage of this because we didn't have our own party movement that was rooted in these communities that had strong organization that had a strong working class base that had political leadership that had, you know political consciousness that was actually able to that was actually able to give political expression so instead it was the ngos and the activist movementist left that gave you know political expression to this and Another thing is, is, you know, we also don't really, the left doesn't have its own mass media apparatus. And as a result, the bourgeois media completely controlled the narrative about this movement and popular consciousness. And so essentially these riots, which were, you know, a multiracial, primarily working class, you know, revolt against police violence, were essentially transformed to the popular consciousness as, you know, a race war and a purely a, a racial thing. It was a great awakening and you know, both the liberals and the right wing basically kind of portrayed this as a merely a racial conflict. And, you know, right wingers are saying this was a color revolution against Trump, that the, the liberal leads backed by Soros were trying to, you know, basically coup Donald Trump. And that, you know, all the Antifa and BLM people are just like foot soldiers for, you know, these this dark deep state conspiracy of Soros. Whereas, you know, the liberals, you know, they basically made it entirely about a culture war where, you know, this is just, we just need more people to go to a white fragility, uh, racial um, sensitivity trainings. And, you know, we just need to have a national conversation about race and, you know, you know maybe we'll make some cuts to police budgets, but, you know, in the end, that's basically what this amounted to. And the left really had no programmatic clarity in order to, you know, make a proper political intervention. You had, you know, kind of these maximalistic calls for the full abolition of the police, which are correct in spirit. You know, I hate the police and I think, you know, the current police order obviously has to go. But the problem is, is that the left didn't really provide any kind of programmatic direction. The idea of a people's militia, of actually arming the people and creating some kind of radical Republican alternative to, you know, the police system wasn't really addressed. And instead, you know, it was just kind of these calls for pure negation of the current uh, carceral system. And, you know, you had various, uh, you know, I saw a lot of various Trotskyists like saying, yes, it's true that we're not gonna be able to abolish the police without abolishing capitalism. But if we tell the masses, you know, that we need to abolish the police and mobilize them under this slogan, they'll realize this and then they'll abolish capitalism. It's classic uh, kind of a Trotskyist uh, approach. And I don't mean to say all Trotskyists, but there definitely were Trotskyists who had that approach. And so the left was only capable of a negative vision here, regardless of how just that vision is, without any kind of positive vision of a different order being possible and making that vision legitimate and relevant to people, it's, you're not going to really go anywhere. And so in the end, this means that, you know, despite a nationwide revolt against the state, the only real political alternative was thrown up by the Biden campaign. This was not some like conspiracy of elites, you know, to create a color revolution, you know, that would inevitably end up supporting Biden. It's just a natural result of the left really lacking any kind of political alternative to the existing parties. So in the US, we essentially see this, like, you know, this ratchet to the right being in full effect, and it still is. And in this case, anti-fascism basically served the role of disciplining the left and supporting the Biden campaign. And of course, you know, this was not without resistance. You know, as I said, a lot of people in DSA opposed the call to go against a resolution to only support Sanders. But nonetheless, you know, there were some left media people like, uh, you know, the Chapo Trap House guys who are popular who said, you know, we're not going to vote for Biden. Screw that. Nonetheless, like there was, if you just look around the left, 
and you look around what people are saying about the election, a lot of people ended up deciding to vote for Biden and, and getting behind Biden because the message was is that if you didn't, you were complicit in fascism, regardless of how much you hate Joe Biden, it was necessary to vote for Joe Biden because there was a, a Trump coup that was going to happen and Biden needed as large of, needed as large of a turnout as possible to, to avert this coup potential. And so basically what you're, you know, we're seeing here is you know, this idea that you know, the left needs to the rally behind the centrist liberal order in order you know, to stop the far right. And after we stop the far right, then we can actually organize a centrist against the centrist libs. What happens is the centrist libs get in power, they, and they just you know, make the far right get more intense and more radical. And, and then you know, the next four years come around and we just have to vote against the far right again and, and nothing changes. So of course, you know, Biden won the election. It was, he did legitimately win the election. I'm sure I don't have to convince any people here otherwise. You know, the, the accusations of voter fraud and a stolen election are just absolutely insane. And I understand that our electoral system is incredibly corrupt and people don't have trust in it, but Biden won the popular vote here. He, you know, as much as I despise him and he did win the popular vote in a democratic election. And it's actually interesting how, you know, Biden had the largest turnout ever simply because more people came out to vote. And what's interesting is Trump was actually, actually lost some of his, uh, his blue collar voters. A lot of those people that, you know, were Obama voters had, who had went over to Trump went back to the Democrats. And it's funny is, despite, you know, Trump's, you know, chauvinism and, and just nativism and absolute racism, he did have a slight increase in minority voters. So, you know, this, despite the fact that minority voters did ultimately come out to support, you know, Biden, and it just is interesting how Trump was kind of able to, um, to bring in you know, more minority voters in his fold, lead it, losing some of the kind of, um, like blue collar, uh, white working class voters that supposedly like are the, the core base of Trump. I think a lot of that is because, you know, a lot of dissatisfaction with, you know, the decay of economic, of the economy in the US, a lot of people went to Trump because they identified the Democrats with NAFTA and free trade policy, but their lives did not improve whatsoever under Trump. And so they, they, just, they went back to voting liberal. And, you know, you have these people who think that there's going to be this political realignment that essentially, you know, the Republicans are going to become the real working class party, that economic populism is, is going to become this big thing again, that uh, essentially there's, you know, the, the Republican, the, the, you know, the reactionaries are the new rebels at the, the the left are essentially just handmaidens to the liberal elite. And so the real opposition to capitalism, the real opposition to the system is going to come from this kind of new right wing populism. And you have various uh, people, you know, trying to kind of poach disaffected leftists, get them on board with his agenda. agenda. You have uh, the American affairs people, you have uh, people like the Bellows and this kind of idea that, you know, there's this post left that we're going to, you know, move away from you know, social leftism and just kind of create this uh, socially conservative economic populism and that's future politics. The truth is that the Republican party is owned by its donors and his donors are not going to allow for any kind of meaningful policies to be passed by the Democrats who are going to redistribute wealth and, and touch the property regime of this country. That's just not going to happen. Or, you know, this, this right-wing populism thing, it's just, a, it's a big demagogic, scam they're not actually going to do shit for american workers or we're just going to rail against immigrants and and amp the culture war up and create scapegoats and uh it's just it's not going to happen and so anyway so trump claims the election is stolen and you know, it's, I just kind of want to say a little bit about the whole QAnon phenomenon because it's it really is like the the peak American style of, of the paranoid style of American politics. And this QAnon conspiracy basically portrays Trump. He's at war with a deep state. 
that's trying to prevent him from enacting his agenda. The deep state are like a bunch of pedophile elites. And basically the idea is that uh, Trump needs to install a military dictatorship and, and purge the degenerates of this, you know, in the country and um, reestablish like the true American, uh, you know, a true American national uh, mythos. It's very much this kind of centralization of all these different conspiracy theories into one kind of thread that is able to mobilize pe like people. And, you know, these conspiracy theories like becoming normalized by Trump is it kind of like lets him become like the party of white anarchy. Whereas, you know, the, the Democrats are kind of like the party of order. Because, you know, essentially Trump is kind of able to mobilize this kind of white populist resentment against this increasingly multicultural world order. And I think, you know, capitalism does kind of need like a global market with some kind of multiculturalism. So you can have, you know, interactions between different groups and you can have commerce. Whereas a lot of, you know, and so this right-wing populism is kind of about, you know, mobilizing people against this multiculturalism. So it, it's it's the way that, you know, the, uh, the liberal centrists see it as like, it's just white anarchy breaking down the norms of democracy. But the issue is, is, you know, the Republicans also want order. So they can only kind of rile up this, this Trump, this base, this kind of populism so much to an extent before basically, um, you know, returning to stability in the rule of, of law. And you saw this in this week's events completely. So before I talk about more about um, what's going on recently, I kind of want to speak about the whole force the vote debate, because I actually think this is a very interesting and important debate in the US left right now. A lot of people think it's just a waste of time, but I think it really shows kind of the tensions and the popular consciousness that's going on today. And so essentially this forced to vote thing is about Medicare for all. It's spearheaded by this left populist movement for a people's party attempt, which is basically a kind of post Sanders attempt to kind of um, organize a few of uh, a few kind of like left populist celebrities and to kind of, um, you know, manufacture this you know, left populist party out of nothing. I don't really think is going to work. The guy who runs it is uh, his name is Nick Brana, and his kind of model is a uh, AMLO from Mexico. So you know it's something to keep an eye on, because anything that kind of disrupts the two-party system is is good in my opinion, just in the sense that it kind of helps create better circumstance for a real socialist party. But essentially, um, you got this guy Jimmy Dore. He's kind of a a left you know comedian, left liberal comedian, shock jock, and basically, um, you know, made this argument that AOC and the squad should refuse to vote for Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House, unless Pelosi decided to do a floor vote on Medicare for all as a concession. So essentially, they want to force the vote, they're trying to pressure the Democrats into um, allowing a floor vote on Medicare for all. And the idea is that even if it doesn't pass, it will show what side Democrats are on so that we can, uh, so we can uh, basically target those people in primary who, who voted against it. And the reaction was, was very disappointing. Essentially AOC responds to Dorr and says, you know, that such an action would just set her back and anger potential allies. And it was more important that she horse trades to get on you know, various house committees, which will put her and her allies in a better position to bargain for Medicare for all in the future. The reaction from Jimmy Dore and his, you know, kind of fan base of disaffected and angry, you know, people who really, really want Medicare for all, I guess, for just saying that she's refusing to take seriously the needs of her constituency. She's failing to recognize the urgency of Medicare for all. She's choosing a horse trade for favors with the enemy rather than taking an aggressive oppositional stance for our needs. So yeah, it, you know, and then so the debate blows up and you have all these different leftist commentators like basically saying that, uh, you know, this is stupid. You know, this, these people have no, these forced to vote people have no real strategy. They're just rabble rousers. And, 
you know, the, the force to vote side is, is honestly becoming extremely toxic. Like they kind of think that if they just yell at people online and bully people online, they'll be able to pressure them into doing what they want. Or, you know, opponents of force to vote and basically point out that Jimmy Dore is just a grifter. This guy is just looking to build his media career by making lots of attention. You know, he doesn't actually care about, about getting you guys health care. He just cares about, um, he just he just cares about you know building his media career. It's all a grift. His force to vote stuff is stupid. And you know, they're probably right about Jimmy Dore. You know, I don't I don't have any stock in defending this guy. He he has held a lot of just absolutely idiotic political positions in his life, like supporting the anti-corruption thing against Lula and Brazil. And you just he just has no real political sense. But in this case, I think his his he has the right kind of spirit. So I think what is interesting about this is how a lot of the kind of um, the mainstream, like more established left, you know, people are reacting to this kind of saying like you, this is not your place to like, you know, talk about strategy. You know, we have expert leftists, professional leftists here who you know, know what we're doing. And, you know, you people trying to tell us to force votes, you don't have any real strategy. We're the real strategy. We have the real strategy, but they don't actually say their strategy because I don't think they actually have a real strategy. And so, Basically, like what happens is you have this kind of popular discontent with, you know, AOC and the squad trying to push for a more oppositional approach. And then you have all these people saying, no, that's not what we need to do. It's actually correct that, you know, we need to kind of horse trade to get on these House committees. And there's really nothing wrong with the squad's existing strategy. Ultimately, this force to vote stuff is just pointlessly dividing the left. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe it, you know the whole force to vote thing is it's not, it's, it is like not exactly the right strategy what's interesting to me is that it shows that there is a growing desire for an actual oppositional left electoral strategy in this country and this is you know and it's it's also a political debate about strategy and tactics that is taking place you know in the public at large beyond just like the instituted like leftist kind of um you know, publications and in those circles, it's not just happening in those circles, it's happening like outside of those circles. And I feel like a lot of this professional left just don't like that. They don't like that this kind of, uh, you know, rabble rousing of Jimmy Dore is, you know, interfering with their rightful sphere of uh, in politics. And, you know, and this guy, Jimmy Dore has no real political vision, but he's making a real point. And it's a point that he's ultimately incapable of making because he has no real political vision. But so this raises the question, so why should we let the opposition to this, you know, current, you know, this, you know, the current left's collaboration with the current order, and instead of, you know, taking up this critique ourselves and making a more defined and oppositional stance. You know, Dorf politics, they can't give us a roadmap. The general point he's making is one that the Marxist left should be making, and that we need to have an oppositional and defined electoral strategy, not a collaborationist one. And which means that you know the left needs to have its own party. You know, and the problem with Dore is essentially it's a it's a populist vision. So you know it's a it's a cross class vision. He, you know, the movement for a people's party is essentially what um you know people call pop up populism. You get you know a few celebrities together and you kind of do a focus group to determine like how can we kind of make messaging that will be popular, and so you know, and then how do we um you know make a social media campaign that will advertise this to people and that's going to get people excited or drum up support through social media and that will create a voting block and that's how we're going to create a party and that's you know i don't think that that's there's obviously i don't think it's any way forward but it is important to me that we engage with these people because what they are saying and what they are arguing for is in, in a lot of ways in spirit correct <clears throat> and so and it's just really frustrating to see how much of the left is just scolding the force to vote people instead of like engaging with them and saying, listen, I hear your point, but maybe we shouldn't vote for Pelosi at all. And, and maybe we should, you know, we should be trying to form our own party. And maybe the squad itself just isn't going to be a, a tool for us that we can kind of boss around because ultimately they are Democrats and the incentive for them is to, to fold into the Democratic party. And, you know, AOC did get her house appointment and returned her vote for Pelosi so, I mean, this just makes clear to me that, you know, they are on the path to coming a loyal opposition to Democrats. 
And I don't think that forcing votes is just like pure theater and spectacle with no real you know, political basis to back it up. You know, a couple of years ago, DSA themselves said in their Medicare for All campaign that forcing the vote is a legitimate tactic. Abolitionists in the United States used vote forcing to reveal who is, was on what side, even though they knew they were not going to win. It is a legitimate tactic. And the way that the left was just announcing this tactic was really frustrating. But on the other hand, you know, we have this kind of anti-parliamentary Cretanism. You know, we have both parliamentary Cretanism and anti-parliamentary Cretanism in the left. So, you know, one says that we can push the Democrats to the left, or, you know, they'll say we need a dirty break. But in the meantime, we have to run as Democrats and use their ballot line because we don't have our own infrastructure in our own party. And, you know, the other side basically says, you know, we just, you know, we don't want, you know, electoralism itself is just a complete waste of time. You know, street protests are where it's at or you know, base building is, you know, economic base building is what it's at. Electoral politics is just not a, a zone of intervention for us. So what I think that force to vote allows for is that we can make a point as Marxists for a third option, principled class independent oppositional electoral strategy that is rooted in the mass organizations and the party movement of, you know, a mass socialist party. And so my opinion, what we need to be doing to form such a party is I think that basically the Marxist left should work in DSA. I think that what we need to do is form some kind of a Marxist unity slate to push for various resolutions that will put the organization on the road to becoming a class independent party with its own program. In my opinion, it should be a minimum maximum program. It should be a, it should be a, an old workers party. And um, I think uh, Jonah Martel gave a presentation uh, a few weeks ago that gave a more precise roadmap for how to do this. So I don't kind of want to tread that same water. If you want to read on cosmonaut.blog, his article, uh, 12 step program to break democrat addiction it's what you want to read that kind of offers the vision that i think that the left should take up for changing dsa and you know a lot of the far left basically says that this is just pure liquidation you know that essentially we're taking our own pure revolutionary marxist left and we're just going to liquidate it into this alliance with reformists and you know we're just going to put all our energy into electing democrats instead and what we need to do is be you know, we need to be organizing our own independent, you know, groups. But my answer to this is essentially that the left really doesn't have any own, you know, for the most part, there are local leftist groups that do have their own infrastructure. But for the most part, you know, the left really doesn't have an independent infrastructure of its own to liquidate into the DSA. And furthermore, the DSA right now does not have a solid political direction. The Bernie campaign failing has essentially left the organization adrift. And so where the organization goes in the future is, is something that is up, it's something that's up to, a, it's up for contestation. There's no guaranteed trajectory of where DSA will go. It's very much possible that it will go more in the direction of becoming a progressive lobbying group for the Democrats. It's also the direction that it will go in the direction of becoming a real force for independent Marxist politics. And the way that this happens, that the way that this goes is contingent upon political struggle within the DSA. And the DSA is a mass membership organization, dues funded, that is you know, ultimately democratically run without, it does not have a super consolidated bureaucracy. And so this is something that we could join as Marxist and we can democratically as equals put forward our ideas and try you know, to push the emerging socialist movement in a more positive direction. The downside is that we have invested a lot of energy into something that went nowhere. Sure, we might have, you know, learned a lot of lessons, but, you know, ultimately it went nowhere and we failed. But the upside is that we have a massive impact in pushing the socialist movement in the U.S. in a more Marxist direction. And so, the upside beats the downside of participating. It's a risk, it's a wager, but everything in politics is. And so I think that ultimately, 
working in DSA and pushing the 12 step program that comrades and cosmonaut have been talking about is really, you know, the prospects for the left. There are, you know, other groups in the left that are doing good organizing that are growing. But I think ultimately, if the left is going to unite around the mass party, that axis of unity is going to be something that comes out of DSA. Perhaps DSA will will split somehow between the more, you know, Democratic Party oriented and the more kind of a independent oriented people. It's hard to say. But I think that ultimately the prospects for the left lie within trying to transform what exists of the existing left into some kind of mass party. And uh, how much time do I have left? Five minutes, okay. So basically my conclusion here is we are seeing a ratchet to the right in full effect. You know, the Democrats are going to move to the right more and more. There's no incentive for the Democrats to move to the left because in order to get votes, they just have to be a little bit to the left of the Republicans and they want to be able to get as much donor money as possible. And so it is in every incentive of them to be as, you know, to move as right as they can on all economic issues, essentially, as long as they can be to the left of Democrats on the minor social issues that to, to pose themselves as the lesser evil. But what's different now is we are seeing embryonic forms of political organization that could potentially counter this ratchet to the right. And so that is what, that's, is what, that is, what is at stake here. And that is why the US left needs to end its sectarianism and start struggling for programmatic unity.